on World News Tonight. Rising floods. China battles yet another major natural disaster as torrents reach deadly speeds. Fresh allegations. Whistleblowers come forward with shocking recounts of police response at the Capitol riots. Possible cure. AstraZeneca reveals a prevention and treatment all in one vial. Sky high. Germany takes to the skies with the latest fight to the top in a special kind of craft. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with deadly flooding in northern China. More than 120,000 people have been evacuated, coal mines shut and crops destroyed after unseasonably heavy rains flooded north China's Shangxi province and more rainfall is expected in the coming days. These are just some of the 120,000 people who've been temporarily evacuated from their homes in Shangxi province. Volunteers delivered food and other supplies to the flood-hit communities over the weekend. We have gone all out to deploy all kinds of emergency supplies, including equipment and vehicles, and to mobilize professional and non-professional forces from various communities to participate in the rescue efforts. A major river runs through this city, and over the weekend it saw its highest flood peak in nearly 40 years. China has a four-tier emergency response system for flood control, with the lowest level currently in place in Shangxi. Millions of people across the northern province have been affected by severe flooding that was triggered by continuous torrential downpours that began last week. The heavy rains have caused more than 17,000 houses to collapse and damaged around 190,000 hectares of crops. Relief and rescue efforts are well underway, but have been hindered by the persistent rainfall. Provincial authorities have earmarked the equivalent of 6.7 million euros to support flood control and relief work. The current crisis comes barely three months after torrential rain and flooding in Henan province left more than 300 people dead. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has called for the strengthening of his regime's military capabilities to counter what he insists are hostile forces against the North. But he has also underlined that the move is not aimed at Seoul or Washington. The North's leader Kim Jong-un has criticized the U.S. saying that there are no grounds to believe Washington is not hostile toward Pyongyang. According to the North state media on Tuesday, Kim made the statement Monday in a speech at a defense development exhibition to mark the 76th founding anniversary of the ruling Workers' Party. He went on to accuse Washington of creating tensions on the Korean Peninsula and said such tensions will not be easily resolved because of the U.S. Gim also denounced Ashar for being, quote, hypocritical and having double standards for continuing to boost military capabilities. Kim Jong-un then pointed out that strengthening national defense is the regime's number one priority. Yet, he made sure to note that such a move is not intended to target a specific country like the South or the U.S., adding that the North's main enemy is war itself. He then added that the horrific history of using armaments against the same people on the peninsula should not be repeated. Gim's speech came less than two weeks after the North test-fired a new anti-aircraft missile in what was its fourth missile launch in September alone. There was a no-military parade to mark the founding anniversary on Sunday. Instead, Kim Jong-un delivered a speech that he will work towards improving his people's living conditions, pledging to resolve issues related to food, clothing and shelter for the next five years. Over in the United States, scathing new actions involving the January 6th Capitol riot has been revealed as a whistleblower blasts a real-time response of the leadership of Capitol Police. New fallout tonight from an explosive letter written by an anonymous former Capitol Police officer describing top department officials as responsible for the single greatest intelligence failure in the history of the U.S. Capitol Police. Calling out senior leaders Yogananda Pittman and Sean Gallagher specifically, quote, what I observed was them mostly sitting there, blankly looking at the TV screens showing real-time footage of others. A law enforcement source tells the two leaders were focused on the evacuation of congressional leadership. Capitol Police say although there's more work to do, many of the problems described in the letter have been addressed and that they're committed to learning from prior mistakes. It's all the more reason that we need to continue to see an aggressive January 6th bipartisan commission 
pursue the ground truth of what happened that day. It comes as the former president rallying in Iowa this weekend hints at another run. We're using the same slogan, make America great again. And clings to the lie that triggered that insurrection, that the election was stolen, even though it was not. I never conceded, never. But state after state where the election was close conducted audits to check the vote totals. Georgia even counted three times, with all of it confirming again that Joe Biden won. Still demonstrating Mr. Trump's hold on his party, this new dodge from a top GOP leader. So you think the election was so stolen? I, I, stolen? What I said is there are states that didn't follow their legislatively set rules. Do you think the election was stolen? Yeah. And it's not just irregular, it's states that did not follow the laws set, which the Constitution says they're supposed to follow. Britain and Ireland traded bars on Twitter after British Brexit negotiator David Frost restated his view that EU must agree significant change to the Northern Ireland protocol that governs trade and border rules in the province. For more on this, we have Abu Dhar Nawal News Special Correspondent Malshi Abeseka reporting from Norwich in the UK. For more, Malshi. Yes, Shanali. The protocol was part of the Brexit settlement Prime Minister Boris Johnson negotiated with the EU, but London has repeatedly said that it must be rewritten less than a year after taking foes due to the barriers businesses face when importing British goods into Northern Ireland. Ireland's Foreign Minister Simon Coveney on Twitter asked if the UK government actually wanted an agreed way forward or a further breakdown in relations. That drew a rebuke from Frost, who responded they prefer not to do negotiations by Twitter. Frost dismissed Comey's argument that he was making new demands, saying that Britain's concerns over the European Code of Justice's role in the process were set out three months earlier. Frost had released, released extracts of a speech he's due to make this week again, calling for change and signalling a desire to free the protocol from the oversight of European judges. Responding to that, Ireland's Coney said Britain had created a new red line barrier to progress that it knows the EU cannot move on. The row comes at the start of an important week in the long-running debate over how to manage the flow of goods between Britain, Northern Ireland and the EU. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adha Dharanobol News Special Correspondent Malshi Abeseker reporting from Norwich in the United Kingdom. Many countries have committed to a goal of net zero emissions by 2050 to ever the worst of global warming. And according to the United Nations Climate Conference, COP26, starting in Scotland at the end of October, establishing a global price pricing mechanism for carbon dioxide emissions may be the way to achieve that. Some 25,000 took to the streets in Brussels ahead of COP26, the United Nations Global Climate Conference beginning at the end of October in Glasgow, Scotland. This year's meeting aims to secure far bolder action from the nearly 200 countries that signed the 2015 Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and achieve a climate neutral world by mid-century. Global carbon pricing is one of the mechanisms they hope will achieve that. Many countries have committed to a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. But without putting a price on CO2, it is hard for governments to force polluters to cut emissions without disadvantaging them unfairly, for investors to assess their risks, or for companies to know what costs lie ahead. Bob Dudley, the former head of oil company BP and now chair of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative trying to help the fossil fuel industry decarbonize, said a proper valuation of emissions was one of his group's five main goals. Theodore Swedmark at European Power Engineering Group ABB said aligning carbon-based trade policies was one of the business community's main requirements from COP26. The World Bank says only 22 percent of global emissions were covered by pricing mechanisms last year. And the International Monetary Fund put the average global price at a mere $3 a ton. Yet, the OECD estimates that a price of $147 is needed before 2030 to create enough economic incentives for producers and users of fossil fuels to slash emissions by 2050. The challenge of finding a standardized solution at COP26 for industrialized and developing economies alike will be huge. Tanku Mohamed Taufik, chief executive of Malaysian state energy firm Petronas, noted that carbon is priced at about $5 to $10 a ton in Southeast Asian economies, compared with over $130 in Sweden. 
The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. We have some good news for you. Merck officially asked the FDA to authorize its antiviral pill to treat COVID-19. The company says the pill cuts hospitalization and deaths in half for unvaccinated patients with early symptoms. A pill to treat COVID-19 is one step closer to reality. Merck said on Monday it applied for emergency youth authorization in the U.S. for its tablet to treat mild to moderate cases of coronavirus, putting it on course to become the first oral antiviral medication for the disease. An authorization from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration could be a game changer for how COVID-19 is treated as the pill can be taken at home. The treatment, molnupiravir, cut the rate of hospitalization and death by 50% in a trial of mild to moderately ill patients who had at least one risk factor for the disease, according to data released earlier this month. News of the drug's efficacy heavily dented the shares of COVID-19 vaccine makers. The drug maker has a U.S. government contract to supply 1.7 million courses at a price of $700 per course. Merck expects to produce 10 million courses of the treatment by the end of 2021. Existing treatments like remdesivir are generally given in hospitals, and monoclonal antibody drugs, which are typically infused as well, have so far seen only limited use due to the difficulty in administering them. A decision from the FDA whether to authorize the pill could be weeks away. With more good news, an experimental drug produced by AstraZeneca may be the closest cure to the pandemic as the drug has shown major decrease in contracting severe disease and even preventing death. AstraZeneca's experimental COVID-19 drug has helped cut the risk of severe disease or death in a late-stage study, the British drug maker said on Monday, boosting its efforts to develop medicines beyond vaccines. The drug, which is a cocktail of two antibodies, is the first of its kind to show promise at late-stage clinical trials as both a preventative medicine and as a treatment for the virus. Delivered by injection, the antibody therapy reduces the risk of severe COVID-19, or death, by 50% in non-hospitalised patients who have had symptoms for seven days or less. The results of the trial were announced on Monday. It is designed to protect high-risk people who do not have a strong enough immune response to the current vaccinations. The new drug contains lab-made antibodies designed to linger in the body for months and fight the virus in case of infection. AstraZeneca's vaccine, used around the world, instead relies on an intact immune system to develop targeted antibodies and infection-fighting cells. The trial took place over 13 countries and involved more than 900 adults. The results will be submitted for publication in a peer-reviewed medical journal. AstraZeneca has already requested emergency approval from US regulators to be able to use the antibody cocktail as a preventative therapy. According to a French study, vaccinations is highly effective at preventing severe cases of COVID-19, even against the Delta variant. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Chetan and Dharmarathan, reporting from Normandy in France. Chetan. Yes, Shanali. The research published focusing on prevention of severe COVID and death, not infection, looked at 22 million people over 50 and found those who had received jabs were 90% less likely to be hospitalized or die. The results confirm observations from the US, the UK and Israel, but researchers say it is the largest study of its kind so far. Starting 14 days after a second dose, a vaccinated subject's risk of severe COVID was reduced by 90%. Vaccination appears to be nearly as effective against for the Delta variant with 84% protection for people 75 and older and 92% for people 50 to 75. That estimate, however, is only based on a month of data since the variant became dominant in France only in June. The study co covers vaccination with Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna and AstraZeneca jabs. The results also suggest that over the period of study, vaccination protection against severe COVID did not diminish. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Chetan Dharmaratna, reporting from Normandy in France. Alexei Navalny, Putin's greatest critic, has now had a chance of status through the country's prison committee to the state of an extremist despite no longer being regarded as a possible escape risk. 
Jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny said on Monday that a prison commission had designated him an extremist and a terrorist, but that he's no longer considered a flight risk. Posting on Instagram, the 45-year-old said he had been summoned before a panel, which voted unanimously in favour of the status change. The decision marks a further escalation of pressure against President Vladimir Putin's fiercest domestic critic. Navalny is currently serving two and a half years in prison for parole violations he says were fabricated to thwart his political ambitions. He made light of the announcement, saying that he was glad he was no longer considered prone to escape and would therefore be subjected to less frequent and stringent nighttime checks by guards. It's just that there is now a sign over my bunk that I am a terrorist, said Navalny in the Instagram post, which was published with the help of his lawyers. There was no immediate confirmation from Russian authorities of the change in Navalny's status. The Federal Penitentiary Service did not immediately reply to a request for comment. Navalny's movement suffered a fresh blow back in June when a court ruled its activities to be extremist. Last month, Russia opened a new criminal case against him that could keep him in jail for a further decade. Tunisia named a new government 11 weeks after President Kai Saeed outstood the Prime Minister and suspended Parliament to assume near total control in moves that his critics call a coup. After 11 weeks without a government, Tunisia has won again. It's being led by Najla Boudin, the first woman to hold the post of prime minister in Tunisia or any Arab country. The new cabinet, composed mostly of allies of President Kai Sayed, also includes a record number of women, like Leila Jaffel, a career magistrate heading up the Ministry of Justice, and Siam Bugdiri, a tax expert as finance minister. Taufik Sharfadine is the new interior minister, a post he held previously until being fired in 2020. During the swearing-in ceremony, Boudin said the main priority will be to tackle corruption. One of the most important goals ever is to combat corruption, which is increasingly spreading day by day and leads to a loss of confidence in any radical and real reform attempt. But it's unclear just how much power the cabinet will actually be able to wield. Since July 25th, President Syed has granted himself near total control of the government. He suspended parliament, announced plans to appoint a committee to amend the constitution, and now legislates by decree. During the ceremony, Syed again justified his actions. Syed's critics say his actions amount to a coup. Some 6,000 people took to the streets of the capital on Sunday to rally against Syed's perceived power grab. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The U.S. Chief of Naval Staff paid tribute to slain soldiers at a war memorial in New Delhi. Gilday laid a vault to pay his respect at the National War Memorial and his names of Indian soldiers killed in conflicts with Pakistan, China, amongst others, inscribed on it. Nine people have been killed in the Philippines and 11 were missing due to floods and landslides caused by heavy rain from tropical cyclone Kampasu. Nearly 1,600 people were evacuated. A UN committee tasked with protecting children's rights says countries are legally responsible for the harmful effects of greenhouse gas emissions originating in their territory on children children outside their borders. Three US-based economists have won the Nobel Prize in Economics for their real-life experiments on the labor market. One of the winners showed that a higher minimum wage doesn't have an impact on hiring and the others providing ways of ensuring such studies reflect real-life conditions. The United States and the United Kingdom have warned their citizens to avoid hotels in Afghanistan capital, citing security risks. The two countries issued warnings urging their nationals to avoid hotels in Kabul and urged those who are at or near the Serena Hotel to leave immediately. A small aircraft crash blocks from a high school campus near San Diego, killing at least two people and injuring two others while also destroying homes. At least two homes appear to have been destroyed by an ensuing fire.
And finally tonight, German hot air balloonists took to the skies over the town of Tennessee for the country's championships of 2021. The best 25 balloon pilots in Germany compete in different tasks over five days. The balloonists have to place a fabric attached to a sandbag as close as possible to a mark, in this case a cross. Each balloonist will have to find their ideal height in order to get as close as to the cross as possible. Andreas Bose, the organizer and the president of the German Association of Hot Air Balloons, says that it will be centimeters which decides the winner. Bose said that besides the large commercial enterprises, there are also the serious sport balloonists like himself who are passionate about ballooning. And as like in any other big sport, it is also about the material and the skill of the pilot. Serious money can be involved in the sport. The competition is expected to last until Sunday. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.